it's oh, about wow. eight, eight foot. Okay, which way is that? Is that looking north? That's the case. Welcome back. You're looking at the paintings of Julian Perry. And this is the first of a series of interviews with professionals who have built their reputations upon a desire to do something new with something old, rather than being stuck in the traditions of painting for their own sake. Why do I want to talk to these guys? Well, I'm a painter myself, and during the past five years I've discovered that a device called the Comparator Mirror will allow just about anyone to pick up and practice exactly the sorts of skills which artists like Julian and myself have spent a lifetime trying to perfect. And to my mind, this changes something fundamentally. In short, if anyone can make a realistic painting now, it's important to ask other painters how they feel about this about how much more realistic looking painting can be, about why the Mona Lisa is more than just skillfully handled paint, and what it is precisely that draws us back to recognisable images made by hand time and time again, no matter how creatively confident we feel. How does a child grow up to become an artist where so many others lose confidence, lose interest, and never think of art again? The answer is, I simply don't know, but it'll be fun to find out, so come with me. Let's leave our old assumptions about what makes a good painting or a bad one at the door, and just see what happens. I'm Julian Perry, uh, I'm a painter, a landscape painter based in East London. Painting and drawing are absolutely at the core. Uh, observation, of, of the elements that I then reassemble uh, in the painting. I don't, do not do straight depictions of a topographic location. Yeah. I edit uh, in a painting pictorial sort of way yeah. uh, what I find to tell the story I want to, find, want to tell. But it's, part of it is an inquiry and part of it is a, a means through which to begin using your imagination. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's a journey, and I mean, what I'm trying to produce is, is emblematic images, images yeah. with a significance greater than the specifics of where I was and what I'm even painting. My earliest memories of drawing and painting are of copying uh, the old masters. Right. Uh, I was ill a lot as a child, and I was very fortunate. My brother gave me a book uh, of paintings from the National Gallery. And I used to just sit copying uh, the Haywains and Gainsboroughs and things and Turner. Yeah. That was quite challenging with a pencil. What sort of age were you? I was uh, probably about six, seven, eight, that yeah. sort of age. So it probably did me quite a lot of good, actually, yeah. that uh, naive sort of apprenticeship of just, just looking at it. So when I actually, many years later, got to the National Gallery, it was quite a profound thing to actually see all these pictures that I'd... I'd study it, because to draw something is to study it, really. But I didn't go to a very good a school with a very good art department, but the art teachers recognised that I had, uh, I had some ability. Yeah. And I, used to, I managed to pull off a trick uh, by uh, being, giving up games and sport and doing art instead. <laughs> the, the, the sports teachers realised they weren't missing anything <laughs> and the art teachers were glad to have me so I started to virtually live in the art room yeah. um, and I took various exams quite early yeah. um, because I, I just uh, was immersed in it as a subject. Did you have a sense that you were the kid who could draw? Were there s certain kids who were... Yeah, there were certain kids. I was definitely... Uh, yes, I think I, I, I could, you know. Uh, I, that doesn't mean I didn't have a hell of a lot to learn. It's the, the, the whole point of art college is to knock your confidence out of you mm -hmm. in a way when you get there. Oh, no. I certainly was no different to that. You know, I turned up thinking I'm quite good at this subject and uh, in no uncertain way uh, you're told almost to start again. But that's, that's serious deep learning. Well, I think what I like is the very simple principle of creating something that's greater than the sum of its parts. Mm. Uh, the fact that you can go into a shop and you buy this paint, this coloured mud, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's a very expressive phrase, and, uh, and then combine it in a certain order, mm. on a flat surface, 
and it becomes something that hopefully people will treasure for years and years and years, long after I'm gone. Not that I'm looking for immortality through the paintings, but I, it's just that ability to convert these base elements into gold, really, uh, you know, if that's possible. So uh, yeah. that's what I strive for, and, and it kind of happens, actually. You know, I do these paintings. I did a painting yesterday on the easel. You saw it, and you went, wow. And, uh, you know, it's very satisfying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there is a big disconnect with school, or at least there was in my day. I think schools are a bit better these days. The art teachers are much better informed. Art as a subject is so much more in the public domain. Mm. Uh, there was no Tate Modern, obviously, and now there is a Tate Modern, and sometimes you have to queue to get into it. And I dare say if you stop the man on the Clapham omnibus and said, is this a Matisse or a Picasso, a good percentage of them will be able to tell you which is a Matisse and which is a Picasso yeah. in a way that never would have been the case when I was growing up. People would have just said, well, it's modern art and I don't really like it. What? My first what? impressions were that this is a trick that kind of works. The second was, in terms of making a picture, it feels like running my fingers up a blackboard. It's broken the lucid, fluid, lyrical process of assembling a picture into these ghastly little kind of checks uh, across, across between the mirror and the board. And it was uh, torture. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. This is, that's really good information. <laughs> I've certainly seen the, the videos that you've done, the previous videos you've done, and it's really impressive. You know, the copies of that uh, 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 Rembrandt yeah. are spectacular, beautiful, you know, really, yeah. really good. But it's nothing without good teaching. Yeah, yeah, I suspect you've got to have uh, a context in which the comparator, i.e. the person using it, looks at what they're doing and decides what's good or bad about what they're, what they're getting out of the machine. Would you see that in the right, if the teacher sets up the right context and their knowledge is sufficiently broad yeah. and they're not egotistical about their own ability to teach, that it could be useful in getting, getting into that first the first foot on the rung of the lab of painting. The, the, the difficulty is that the time spent showing people how to use the comparatometer is time that they're not learning to look and to measure and to draw and to, mm. to do all the things that you one traditionally does as far as learning how to paint and draw. Yeah. It could be a bit dangerous, you know, but that said, anything that enables people to go from virtually no experiences, I think that young girl had an oil painting and to paint that picture of that Rembrandt mm. must have been a very positive experience for her and I can only imagine she you know wants to go on and develop and explore yeah. you know her ability to paint and but it's the conversations we could have about Rembrandt after the event or sort of in the tail end of the process that were much more impressive to me than yeah. the painting what I think you're hinting at is that the value doesn't lie in the painting, it lies in the process. And that the process is a very positive thing. Mm -hmm. Because, you, you know, I say to what students I do have, put in easel time, time with a paintbrush in your hand. Yeah. You know, that's what you need to do. The process of trying to get paint to behave in the way that you want it to behave is is a very large percentage of what learning to paint is. Yeah. Familiarity with this stuff and, and how it has this range of abilities from being transparent to opaque, to being sticky, to being wet. You know, all those things. Uh, I suspect that when you're trying to copy a painting, you have to get the consistency right. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're not going to get very close. So you have to question the, the quality of the paint in a very sophisticated way that an awful lot of art historians when they're looking at a painting that's dry, you know, been dry for hundreds, hundreds of years and they're mm. looking at it on the walls of the gallery are incapable of that kind of analysis of what's wet and what's sticky and what's dry. You know, there's still debate going on about Rembrandt's technique. It's yeah. incredible. They, they haven't resolved his technique. Um, I like your attitude. See, a lot of people would 
think they wanted to talk about the mechanics or the technicality of the of the actual thing. Yeah. Whereas what you're interested in is the rather more esoteric stuff about the creation of a painting mm. um, and how you can place this optical device in the middle of that process. Yeah. Uh, make, or or even, way. make or even understand a painting. Yeah. How even yeah. non-painters understand painting. Yeah. Uh, I'm at the moment, I'm trying to combine uh, a Northern Renaissance altarpiece and coastal erosion on the east of England. Now that's a really weird combination and I've certainly never seen that combined. But I had this brilliant uh, discovery uh, a couple of days ago that I discovered that in the Isenheim altarpiece, the background is the sea, oh. which is a gift. It's absolutely <laughs> extraordinary. And uh, yeah. so that's a sort of weird sort of relationship. But anyway, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it really does. It's great. Thanks, okay. Jane. Well, it's nice to chat nicely. Well, I've just come from Julian Perry's studio and there is a ton of stuff in my head I could say about the conversation we've just had. But uh, to wrap this up quickly, I think I'm just going to give you a general overview of what I understood from our conversation and then you can make your own minds up about it. I think what was clear is that Julian is a very deeply committed painter and that commitment began at school or even before school uh, when he was copying Constable and Turner and other painters like that. That seemed to be an experience which made drawing and painting personal to Julian. Before exam results or what other people's drawings were like had anything to do with his mindset. And as a painter nowadays, well, he's technically very skillful. The lovely, beautiful, realistic quality of his paintings drew me into them in the studio and made me want to ask deeper questions. But for him, I think, the satisfaction from day to day is about the potential to make a new kind of image each time, rather than the simple trick of making something look realistic. Consequently, he described the comparator mirror as seeming like torture, my reading of that is that he is on the top of the mountain really. He's conquered the problem of technique and he has his own language of painting which he's built up over decades and so consequently he's looking down on the problems of it realizing that the struggle was necessary and this leads me to ask myself an interesting question. Should some things be difficult? Should painting be difficult? I mean I've got probably half as much experience as Julian and I have to tell you that I'm not sure about the answer to that question. I also like what he said about the Clapham Omnibus, Clapham by the way being a district of London. He said that if you went on to the Clapham Omnibus with an image of a Matisse and a Picasso that most people these days would know the difference and that would be because generally painting and drawing and culture at large has become more accessible to the general public. I think that's an interesting thing to say in conversation, but I'm going to treat it as a challenge. I'm actually going to go and do that and see what people's responses are. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I certainly enjoyed making it. My next interview will be with the printmaker, Luke Wade. He's only 28. He's only been a professional for two or three years. And it will be interesting to see if Luke's opinions of the comparator mirror are similarly cautious, given that Luke is right at the beginning of his climb up the mountain. If you've liked this video, I know it's a cliche and everyone on YouTube wants your attention, but do click the like button, do subscribe, and I'll see you next time.